Welcome to Wood Talk. Now here are three guys who might stop by to ask for a cup of slab. Mark, Shannon, and Matt. What's happening, everybody? It's us again, and it's show number 568. <laughs> on today's Hello. show, we're talking about uh, Woodshop versus the HOA. I'd watch that movie. Um, <laughs> sharpening a card scraper, flat bottom, flat bottom table saw cuts, and disposable blade hand planes. But before we get to that, we want to let you know that this show is proudly supported by you and some crappy ads, but also mostly you. And Matt's, Matt's going to tell us exactly how you can help us out. If you want to help support the show, you can absolutely do so by going to patreon.com slash wood talk and signing up to become a patron of the show. We had so many people sit mm. up, sign up to become patrons after the last show that we're all going to take turns and <laughs> read some names as so, fast as we can, but still as respectfully as we can. Yeah, I can only sure. do one. <laughs> Pick one. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's just go with respectful then. <laughs> All right, here we go. Michael Hart, Paul Carey, Jennifer Zinstra, Max and Mindy Coons of Stubby K Studios, Matt Bang, Bangy, just Bang is a silent E. Mm-hmm. Put an accent on there, Bang Gay. Okay, Teaspoon, Christopher Caldwell, William Saul, David Wingate, Ryan Dozer. Craig Sav- Savo, Savio, John McGuire, just Clark, Mark Hertel. All right. So we got more. Chris, uh, you know, I'm just also realizing very good opportunity for someone to have a phony name to make us just say it because we're <laughs> right. not previewing anything. I'm not just thinking that. Just, I didn't even look at the list. This no, went. we're just going. So here I go. Okay. Chris, <laughs> Michael Burns, Brandon Ayers, Sean Tech. Tackaberry? He was in police Wasn't academy. Wasn't that in a police academy? <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> oh, wait, I think it's Tackaberry. Well done, Mark. Well done. Okay, here we go. We're on the same page. <laughs> Thorsten, Larry Silverman, Ed Armitage, Tyler Long, Darth Rust, James Gavix, Nick, Brandon Kane, Cameron Cope, Jeff Johnson, Rich Dodson, Mike Ramona, Jeff Fontaccio, Michael Mike Strickland, Ramona. Zachary ba- Bone or Bon, and uh, Chris Franklin. Okay. Uh, Stefan, um, Eric Fairchild, Jerome de Young, the plaid rockler. We like him. Joe Krug. <laughs> um, I think this is an imperial droid. M61 Maunula. Yeah. Brian McAllister, John Dolislager, Nicholas Lauber, Keith Schnackenberg, Chris Stretch. Those are two people, Chris and then <laughs> yeah. Stretch. Don't get them confused either. Bill Chapman, Bill Mansfield, Jim Sauber, Don Powell, Richard Scipioni, uh, Phil Smith, Luke Parker, and Jason Cassis. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the support, everybody. Seriously. You know, we were kind of open about how things were going and what we needed from you. And you guys really came through with a lot of Patreon support. We appreciate that. And we will continue to try to find ways to thank you besides just saying your name. Uh, but that's all we can do for right now. Also, the ad-free version of the show is something that we can do for you. Uh, We've got almost that many more names to read. We will read those on the next show. So if you haven't heard your name. (laughs) It's a lot of names. Yeah, we're going to get you on the next one. And we're doing them all now. Yeah, we're doing them all now because we we don't want to get behind. Like, uh, I want to stay current with those things. Yeah, right, Mark's assuming that there's going to be just as many people in the coming weeks. and I assume there's going to be at least one. I appreciate, and we're gonna want to appreciate read your naivete. <laughs> yeah. All I right, want to so. revisit the um, woodshop versus the HOA. Like the more I, you say mm. that, like I'm, I think we need to cast that. I think. Well, there's going to be a question about it. So, yeah, I think we yeah. Will that, that'll be a few it. for a future episode. So, how about that? Like, if you if you have your cast in mind, I'm just thinking like the burbs who would star like perfect in, in thing. That. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I don't know. We'll have to see. Yeah. Proof okay, well, I think we could do a what's on the bench segment because it's been a long time and uh, you would think some things have passed across our benches. Uh, whole things. Um, but Shannon, wh- what do you got going on? All right, well, <clears throat> I'll make Mark uh, feel a little bit bad with his unintentional pun when he says some things have passed. Um, my mom passed. Oh, hold on. Um, <laughs> That's distasteful. <laughs> but it's not distasteful because it's my you, mom. Only my mom you a, My mom appreciated that, a good pun. <laughs> only you could make that joke in this instance. And I'm, I'm right. going to give you a I'm pass the only on one oh. who can make the joke. You're not allowed to laugh. Stop laughing. We're already there. <laughs> I'm, try, oh, I'm trying boy. not to. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll come back. No, um, <clears throat> I mean, I've, I've not made a secret of this. I post on Instagram a couple of times. Certainly all the hand tool school people know because I've done videos on it. But, uh, you know, my mom's been, been she's been sick since COVID and it wasn't COVID. Um, and it's it's been a long struggle. So it's one of those, you know, bittersweet type things. The, the good news is, is we knew it was coming. We all had plenty of time to have those difficult conversations. I mean, my mom and I planned her entire funeral, which, you know, as a musician, I'm on the spot to uh, do all the singing and all that stuff. But the, the reason I bring this up is we also had time to plan what she wanted me as a woodworker to do. So mm -hmm. I know we've talked about like building your own coffin in the past, but uh, this is, it, it's weird. I, it's weird to say I'm excited about this build because obviously, you know, I wish that I didn't have to do this, but sure. um, yeah. I am building a, a, a Tansu um, urn. So uh, wow. if you're not familiar with Tansu, Google it. It's immediately recognizable. It's like a, a lot of uh, heavy iron banding and things like that. It's a really cool Japanese style. Um, well, one could just say Asian style because I know there's some Korean and, and Chinese versions with really cool Asian sounding names, you know, that mm -hmm. de delineated as Chinese or Japanese or Korean Tansu. I'm going, I'm going full kimono on this one. Um, <laughs> Uh -oh. I'm building it from Kiri, which was the traditional wood that Tansu is made from, uh, or uh, Polonia, as we know over here, or Princess Tree, however you want to put it. Um, this was a Kiri that um, a friend of mine had come down in their yard, and I went out and like processed oh, wow. the log and bucked yeah. it to shape Go and in. brought it all yeah. home. And I've been, you know, <laughs> slowly building trailer. stuff from it for five <laughs> years now, and uh, I still wow. got a lot left. This was a big tree, but yeah, I went out into the yard and I. <clears throat> split some out. I, I had this conversation with my mom back in Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Like, this is what she wanted. And I'm like, all right, so let's go bring some Kiri in from the yard. And I split out some wedges and, you know, broke it down like as far as I, I, I wanted to, not really knowing what I was going to do with it. And I've had it in the shop kind of drying now. And just a couple of days ago, I started processing it uh, into boards, you know, from split wedges into actual flat boards. And I was, I was doing it and it's like, you know, this is certainly it's a labor of love, but like, it's really cool. My mom grew up in Japan. Uh, my grandfather helped to rebuild the Japanese merchant fleet after World War II. So they were for all intents and purposes stationed in Japan through the fifties and the sixties. She went to high school, graduated from high school in Japan. So like her personality was very much defined by her experience there. And, sure. you know, just recently we were, you know, going through the house and preparing an estate sale and like pulling like her Japanese artifacts and things together. And it's really kind of cool what I'm able to build now. Like my grandmother took a Japanese calligraphy class in like 1955 or something like that. So I have her, what a scrolls, I don't know if that's the official word for it, but um, scrolls with her Japanese calligraphy with her initials and the family initials. So I have that kanji script. So I'm able to mm -hmm. like carve that into the box. And it's just, it's going to be a very, very personal build. I really spared no expense on buying uh, authentic Japanese Tansu hardware and everything. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is, it's a, it's a cool build. I honestly, I think I texted you guys about this. I honestly don't know how much of it I'm going to film. It's gotten me excited about Tansu again. I built the Tansu box like, in the early days of the Renaissance Woodworker, like 2008. It's way, way back there. It's probably 360p because that was high def back then. <laughs> um, so the I'm not stuff. even gonna tell you to go watch it because it will yeah. probably be horrible. It's just kind of reminding me how cool the form is. The thing about this urn is like, you know, Tansu, is, it's got lots of drawers and like cabinets and moving parts. This is a sealed box. So I can't really like dig into the form that much. So part of me feels like just, just building it and just making it like a, you know, a meditation to, to, to mom, you know, I'll take pictures mm -hmm. and certainly on up on Instagram and who knows, probably halfway through I'll turn on the camera because old habits die hard, but more than likely I'll end up probably building something a little bit more involved a little bit later on. But yeah, yeah. I've got Zelkova a veneer or uh, Kiyaki is the Japanese term for it's, it's basically like a Japanese elm tree. Mm -hmm. I'm going to veneer the whole thing in it. I do have to figure out a little bit how to make a sealed box that has to open because I don't physically have the ashes. My brother has them in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I have the exact dimensions of, you know, the box that the crematorium gave us. So mm -hmm. I know exactly how big and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger just in case. So the last <laughs> thing I want to do is get there and 
you know, have to crack open mom and dump her in. We don't want to yeah. do that. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, I have to figure out, like, since I'm veneering the whole outer and I don't want any ingrain of the substrate showing, I've got to figure out the best way that I can veneer it. And still, I'm thinking of having the end of the box kind of slide out the bottom, and then you can move the interior box in and then slide it back in. Mm -hmm. And then with the corner bracket hardware, I have to be able to put that in and just tap the tacks in yeah, place and that will seal it in. close mm -hmm. the box, you know? Sure. Um, but I still like, I was thinking of like having that in panel kind of have almost like a raised panel. So like a rabbit all the way around it that would slide in a groove on the other box, mm -hmm. but then that leaves ingrain on the end of the box exposed. So I'm gonna have to like veneer the ingrain or put a slice of veneer over the in panel that covers it. I covers up the ingrain. I haven't yeah, figured okay. that part out yet. Like normally, if you do a full veneered box, you would veneer the box and then slice the top off, which I suppose I could do that. But I don't know. I don't, I don't really, I definitely don't want to put hinges on this thing. I want this to be a sealed box. And I mean, ultimately, mm -hmm. it's being buried. So, yeah. um, well, and you're going to count on someone else potentially doing the sealing part of the process or. No, 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 no. The, so my, my brother it. has it. Uh, we plan to meet like on Friday. I oh, get okay. in. Friday morning, we'll meet on Friday. He'll hand me the box. I'll slide it in and then nail the brackets, okay. the corner brackets. So if on. it turns out something like a little bit complex, you're going to be the one handling it at least. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And if nothing else, I can do the old uh, Roy Underhill trick. Just keep moving it around keep so the camera can't faster. focus on it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Keep, keep, keep the exposed ingrain side towards me. You know, <laughs> yeah. and set it into the ground. No, I, it, it's, yeah, like I said, I, I'm not like, Mark had asked prior to the show, sorry, I have two cameras up and I keep looking in the wrong one. Um, Mark had asked prior to the show, like, do you feel comfortable talking about this? And at this point, like, totally. Like, I've, I've you know, I'm not going to say you're through the grieving process, but I mean, she she passed in January. It's, it's now three months later. We've had lots of time to work through the ugly business of the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I think, I think we're, we're well into the healing stage and certainly building the box will be a large part of that. Mm-hmm. But in one of my trips to Colorado Springs, um, I had a free night outside the Denver airport and my hotel didn't have a Peloton mark. So what I was going to do, I went for a run, blew the crap out of my knee, what? tore the meniscus, strained the PCL, strained the MCL, put a some sort of leaking cyst on the back of my knee. So I've been limping and barely able to walk for like two weeks. Uh, finally had a procedure last week to the point where I feel a lot better, but like you never realize how much, like when you're hand planing, how much you use your legs. Like you think it's a shoulder and arm thing. So yeah, I've got to build this urn, but like I'm, I'm, I'm crippled <laughs> at oh, this man. point. That so yeah, stinks. that's the, that's the other thing that I did on my break. I tore up my knee. And now the orthopedic surgeon is saying, I think maybe your triathlon career might be over. Maybe just do duathlons <laughs> from now, <laughs> yeah. which that's fine. I still like swimming and I love cycling. I always hated running. So every <laughs> race I've ever done has an aqua bike division. So maybe I'll just do that from now on. I yeah. Aging hey, sucks, to, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's ultimately when you go to an orthopedist and they're like, well, you know, the other thing that happened in the break is I turned 49. So um, it was like, he's like, well, you're almost 50. Um, yeah, suck it up, basically. <laughs> it's just like, thanks, yeah, Doc. This is called Appreciate life that. now. <laughs> Appreciate it. that. Like, you know, you're at an age yeah. where every MRI just shows arthritis. And it's like, well, right. you have moderate <laughs> or severe arthritis. And I'm like, oh my God. It's like, no, 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 no. That's typical for somebody who's 50. It's like, yeah. all right, fine. It's just part of the game. Fine. Uh, I had a, a tennis elbow situation and I went to a doctor and he asked me, like, what exercises do you do, like, in terms of weights at, and things at the gym? This was, this was back in Denver. Uh, and I was explaining what I did and he just looked, he was like, why, why are you doing that kind of exercise? I'm like, I don't know. That's what I've always done. He's like, well, <laughs> you don't need to do those anymore. <laughs> like you got to think about yes. doing Stop doing well, that. <laughs> right. It only hurts when you touch it though. I don't know. But yeah, yeah. so it, uh, that stuff happens. Well, I hope the healing goes well. How's cycling with it though? Well, I, I mean, I have to stay off the bike for at least 30 days. So I got, mm, I've got a couple more weeks. It, that's the part that bothers me is I have a couple of events, not races, like rides, charity rides. I've got this really cool, like scavenger hunt slash mountain bike ride that's in 
four weeks. I mm. really hope I can do it just because it sounds like a lot of fun and yeah. I don't have to go fast. Right. So I'm hoping I can pull that off. But fortunately this year, like I did the Ironman last year, I wasn't planning on doing anything big. I was just going to do some, you know, Fondo type rides. I was going to go on a couple bike packing trips. So everything I'd planned to do was mellow. So yeah. hopefully I can still pull it off. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Unfortunately, I gotta, I gotta do other stuff. Yeah. Go back to the pool. Can't use my mm. rowing machine either. <laughs> Lots of knees in that. Yeah. Well, good luck with that, old man. You are yeah, the, I appreciate that. The appreciate old that. one on the show. So. Stick the knife You're not in. That and far twist behind. It <laughs> hey, you shut up there. <laughs> that's true. That's little, true. The, little man. Mark Mark's birthday is coming up. I always well, I just, know. And it I, I, I hurt myself the, continuously. It's just yeah, right. I You're always hurt. I'm yeah, always, always injured. Yeah, oh, I'm always hurt on your birthday because it's tax day. That hurts. Yeah, that does hurt. That stings a little bit. Okay. Uh, for me, I had a bunch of shop guests, uh, two, that's a bunch as far as I'm concerned. Um, so a gentleman named, it was uh, a crowd. Yeah, it was a crowd. Go away people. Uh, Matt Robinson and Joe Lapolito. These are uh, guild members who came in for like, just, we were trying something. Um, Nicole had this idea that we could bring in a guild member, have them spend a week or so in the shop with me kind of just build along and hang out and learn what they can, but mostly just kind of be there to, to help me do what I do to get a project built. Uh, had a great time with these guys. So the things that we made were a dining table, which included a wiener inlay and uh, some plant stands. <laughs> As one does. Yeah. Some of your like best work. Do. Well, look, mm -hmm. I, I made a table for my brother and I'm sitting there. Actually, here's what happened. I was going to do something decorative for him. And oh, you I did. believe it was frequent emailer <laughs> Alex Adams sent me a message as a joke, like you should do something with a wiener on it. And I'm like, it's a brilliant idea. I mean, most of your ideas are bad, <laughs> Alex, but this one, this is, <laughs> this one's good. And, uh, and I decided to use the, probably for the third time ever, the shaper origin that I bought to, to make this inlay on the underside of the table. My brother was very confused. He just wasn't sure. <laughs> Like yeah. why and what I was trying to say. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. but once you got it, it, you know, went over pretty well. So good nice. times. <laughs> um, and it, I, mean, I, I just have to say that. though, like seriously shaper, like you need to like, oh. if you guys haven't seen it yet, Mark's like Instagram reel that says like, okay, you're a move shaper. I can't remember yeah. exactly how you put it in the end, but like any brand would just be a fool not to jump on that. That's like, that's modern marketing right there, man. Yeah. Come on. I, Show I you actually, your ability uh, to laugh at yourself. And if oh, not, sure. you should sponsor Wood Talk. Cause yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, sex sells, you know? <laughs> yeah. So if, if they become the woodworking device that can allow you to do, I don't know, pornographic images and things like that. I mean, that's, that's an, that's an edge. That's an angle <laughs> that they can take on. That's an edge. You yeah. know, it's, that's, they're unique. <laughs> I had a I had a guy leave a comment on YouTube um, that said something to the effect of um, they are more likely to pay me to take the video down. <laughs> <laughs> well, either way you win, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a win win for me. I guarantee you're oh, not the man. first one. You're just the first one to actually like post it on a channel I, that has I'm thousands sure. of followers. Yeah, that's probably yeah. more likely. The like case. It, that that should actually be like a preloaded design when you get your show. <laughs> oh, great. Origin. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Let me tell you guys, I paid a dollar ninety nine for that on Etsy to get that SVG file. <laughs> oh, and there it. is in my Google search history that makes it so much better. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <it's> SVG penis. <laughs> And normally this is stuff that I make, uh, see Todd, my editor does a lot of things like this when I'm like, Hey Todd, I need, uh, um, give me some line. In this, I need a shot of a bunch of guys that are topless in a hot tub. So he has to go and seek this stuff out for me. <laughs> in this case, I took it on and I, I made that search and I found it and paid a buck 99 to get fair use to use this, <laughs> this image. SVG and it penis. turned out really right. Uh, there's our show title right there. SVG penis. Yeah, it's pretty yes. good. There you go. Um, so uh, Matt, I see you got well. kitchen stuff and I got to tell you, man, I am thinking about like, I am just about to embark on a kitchen redo, but it's like the normal people kind where oh, I yeah. pay someone else to do it. Right. Oh, right. okay. That kind, I'm very yes. curious to see who's yeah. done first. <laughs> like, I, I, would, I would hope you're done first. The, the TLC you're putting into this project is mind boggling. So tell us what is the latest? I forget where we where I was last time we spoke, but uh, you really remember. hadn't done much. Like you I think you were <laughs> leveling, you were leveling some feet on cabinets because you were talking about like, describing. 
Yeah, right. like the, scribing oh, the base to the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah, amount of effort you put into leveling the feet and scribing to the floor, that was like where you would stopped. Well, it, it made for installing my uppers really easily because I made some little riser blocks and I put them on mm -hmm. my lowers, set the uppers on the blocks and they're parallel to lowers, which are level. So my uppers are then level as well. So hanging the uppers was super uneventful. Mm. I just basically put them up there. I had some wave in my wall that had to shim out, but otherwise once that was shimmed out, just pop them up there, screw them to the wall. I put the laser on to check them and yeah, guess what? They're level because they're parallel to the lowers. I think one of the more interesting things that people seem to be really into is I'm doing this like in-cabinet lighting thing where the, the shelves, the adjustable shelves all have light bars on them and they Ooh. pick up their power feed from a bus bar on the case sides. So you can move them wherever you want. There's no wires in the in the case, which is cool. Wow. Um, I was only planning on doing hmm. that for for one cabinet, the um, the tall appliance garage, because that was supposed to have in cabinet lighting or like under countertop lighting in there because it has a countertop. So the architect specced lighting inside of there to be like similar to the um, regular under cabinet lighting. And I was like, how the hell is put this in here? So I found this system where like you can do the bus bars and the wireless shelf lights and you can buy those aluminum bars, but they only sell them in minimum quantities of 20. They're <laughs> okay. eight footers. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I have. So lights everywhere. I have 20 of these bars. <laughs> I'm putting them in everything. I don't yeah. care if we actually put like actually install the lights or not. Yeah. But they're there yeah. if we ever need them. Because yeah, I why have not? 20 of these stupid bars. What else am I going to do with setting them? and stadium setting? Exactly. <laughs> so is this for the enclosed cabinets, like the appliance Correct. garage? That makes sense. Is it something that activates upon opening or oh, there's all tied kinds to of, all kinds of stupid stuff I had to learn about. Um, there's, I mean, you're, this is my, this is my thing, man. I love playing with led lights and stuff like can that. You, can you, can you tie it to a it. clapper? It was That's really cool. Important. I went on the website. I was like, I don't know what I need. So I bought a bunch of random things and have all yeah. these extra pieces and parts here that I can kind of like Lego together and figure out what I actually need before actually ordering everything. So I have mm -hmm. several hundred dollars invested in parts I'll never use. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> There's all different kinds of um, switches and proximity sensors and things you can do for turning the lights on and off. So for the uppers, I have one cabinet that has two doors. I have one cabinet that has three doors. Each door has a sensor on it to tell the light system if one door opens, turn the lights of the cabinet on, either door. Mm. Okay. Um, and there's like a special block you can buy because the drivers are switchable. Then we got one switch inlet. So then you can buy an adapter thing. You can plug more than one switch into the driver so mm -hmm. I, had, I had to learn that thing I'm like oh okay i need three switches on this cabinet but this driver only takes one input so you got like a splitter or something of course yeah. they do they got all kinds of stuff well they got everything you need it's too they much got too much is stuff. there any smart home uh connectivity bluetooth anything you can do that if you get the smart drivers if you want i yeah, of course i don't care enough to do that yeah like well the as cost long as it's proximity much of a difference yeah if it's like sensors in proximity in well, a you kitchen, can do it. You don't necessarily. Want you can do it on like the other stuff that makes sense. Like the under cabinet lighting kind of makes sense, but we're just putting it all on one switch by the sink where all the other yeah. switches are. So I'm like, I don't really need to control it with my phone, really. Well, but if which, you get into some weird things, you can definitely do that. If you want to do like RGB LEDs, you can do that yeah. and have that on your phone in case you but want to do what I have in my shop kitchen now. In your kitchen, and just the light, the light switch that controls the under cabinet lighting is just mm -hmm. the Z-Wave smart switch. Yep. And that's mm -hmm. on a schedule now because under cabinet lighting, like if you're not in your kitchen, it's a great way to just have like just general move around the space lighting. Mm -hmm. So I mean, but you got, you that could have like up. public access. So like kids in Hong Kong can turn on and off your kitchen. lights. <laughs> yeah. That's Who's messing works. with my lights. It's <laughs> the important part. Some yeah. delinquents yeah. in Hong Kong. Everybody's um, got to have smart lights, man. You nah, smart lights are the best. Look at, look at Shannon putting thing. on his little yeah. light show. There. Look at him go. Well, look you know what, go. Matt, Let's talk about it offline because if uh, if I could really make the installers' lives miserable by asking them to like put more stuff in there, oh, uh, yeah. like lights, I may just buy your extra stuff that you don't need because I love you stuff. Lighting is great. That. Put it all it. together. Yeah. The other thing that I was working on, which was a lot more exciting for me, was I built the island, which was built out of slabs. So that got me like actually excited about like wood stuff again and actually like doing stuff that I know how to do, which seems weird because like with the cabinetry stuff, a lot of the struggle with it is just figuring out what the heck it has to be, what size it has to be, how I fit all these switches and closure mechanisms into this thing. Mm -hmm. With like the island, I'm like, okay, it's wood. Let's cut some joinery. This is, it's Morrison tenon. 
Don't yeah. even have to think about it. Just I know how to do this. <laughs> just go. I get to yeah. go back. The hardest part is like picking what part of the slab I want to use. Yeah. Like that was the yeah. hard part. Which like, remember when I, I actually used to enjoy do that? It, it was a lot of that. Like, remember when I used to do this? This is fun. Hardly I actually like this. I could do this. Yeah. I should do more of this. Yep, you should be a woodworker. It's, uh, <laughs> I think you got a knack for it. That's how I knew. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, this is that plywood crap. Sick That's of it. Comfort comfort zone right there. Absolutely sick of pocket holes and plywood. Yeah. And that yeah, stupid domino. That. Hate that thing. So boring. I did one. I did one closet, and I don't want to look at it again anytime soon. <laughs> it was a nice like closet. One closet's worth of plywood. Like I'm good. I'm done. I'm on uh, twenty. My twenty first sheet of uh, three mm. quarter inch plywood. That hurts just thinking about it. It's, hmm. it's a well, lot good of for you. Still cheaper plywood. than hardware. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. I yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> plywood yes. is one of the cheaper things of the whole build. It's cheaper right. than the paint. I think I'll probably end up with more money in paint than plywood. Have you guys done the mm. appliances yet? Yeah, we bought them uh, over two years ago. <laughs> okay. So they've been sitting around. <laughs> well, <laughs> it took like almost uh, the, the fridge took almost two years to show up. So really, at least there's that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were like, that order them now. When we first started the, uh, the, the edition, we're like, they're like, order them now because you don't know how long it's going to take. Also, prices are going up. Okay, I'm like, fine, whatever. Just order, mm -hmm. order, whatever. And then like the fridge took 22 months. The stove took 13 months. And then like is the hood. Is this a the, COVID situation or what, what, what kind of what kind of crap you guys put in your kitchen? I don't it's know. It's because you wanted an stuff. avocado mist. It's uh, Sub-Zero like and a wolf. I don't know. Sub-Zero for some reason is super, super backlogged. Yeah. And it's, it's frustrating because of course, you know, Viking and Sub-Zero brands like super super high end mm -hmm. so they're they're going to a lot of people who are used to just being able to throw money at things to make it show mm -hmm. up faster yeah and it's like no it's it's not a matter of money like yeah. we there's literally there's one make part it <laughs> it's being cast in hong kong right now yeah <laughs> well that was kind of the scary part is like they sent they actually sent us the wrong fridge the, the one oh. that showed up was the wrong one Oof, that's because no the models had changed in the time between when we ordered and when <laughs> like the was filled or whatever and the appliance guy i guess ordered the wrong one changed one of the model numbers so that i didn't notice that until i went to go build the fridge surround i'm like let me unbox this thing and like make sure the numbers in the manual are like actually what they need to be i open it up I'm like this has a two it says a door and a two drawers that's not what we ordered we ordered a single one door unit and i'm like oh crap it took 22 months for this to get here <laughs> And now what? One. <laughs> I'm panicking, right. like, oh no! And they made it made the right one show up in a month somehow. Wow, they fixed that real quick. Like someone fixed it, but <laughs> someone made some call somewhere. It was yeah. like, I screwed up. Please send this yeah. out. So I had the right one. It's sitting there in the barn. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, there you go. Well, that's I awesome. I have to make a panel for it still, but yeah, that'll be a little bit of an easier thing to do at least. Sure. Well, good deal. That sounds good. I can't wait to see it come together. Me too. And I have 14 I hope videos. To be watching <laughs> yeah, this shoot don't still. we all? I hope to be watching episodes of you building it while um, after my kitchen is done. Yeah, uh, sitting in my new kitchen. I, coffee well, <laughs> at a new island. <laughs> Even well, if I Matt's did like, one <laughs> video panels. a week, you got three months still. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you get the backlog, right? Yeah, I, have, well, I went through and like, I'm like, well, I should probably like write down like what videos I have left to get an idea of what's left. I got, yeah. I put 14. So, cool. Jeez, <laughs> look at you. All right, well, try it. Try to be organized, Mark. Try to be professional. Yeah, no, that's good. Over Making all those other content creators look bad. <laughs> uh, I don't he's think been so. Doing that for years. I I doubt it. Most people have, have have retired from YouTube at least three times in the time it's taken Matt to finish his kitchen. That's, <laughs> that's true. Right. There has yeah. been some turnover. I'm still yeah, here for sure. Still doing yeah. this thing. Still kicking. All right. So uh, we get the news and announcements section. This is kind of neither, but uh, <laughs> Alex wrote in. I don't know where else to put it. Uh, Alex Adams, again, the guy with some good ideas. Um, he has a, um, I guess there's a link for where you can buy it, but also a video showing uh, what he calls the helical flush trim router bit of death. I came across this helical double bearing flush trim router bit that is equally exciting and terrifying. I could see it being beneficial for cutting templates in thick, hard, and figured wood. Are you guys more scared or intrigued by this router bit? So go take a look, and we will put the link to this in the show notes if you want to look yourself. I thought 
if I'm not mistaken, I think Philip Morley has one of these and I saw him use it and initially had a reaction of, well, firstly, I want that. Um, <laughs> I mean, think it's a flush trim bit where the cutting thing is not only, and it's not like a regular straight blade. It's like a helical head that you might find on a planer or a jointer. So it's actually carbide inserts that you can turn and rotate to expose the sharp edge over time. So whatever this is, you're going to probably get a whole lot of life out of it. But I am intrigued by this. I think this is super cool. Let me see. Yep. What is the price on it? Do you guys see a I price there? I would imagine 100, 105. <laughs> like the traditional dangers of, that seems of a router good. bit. You know, like, I mean, climb cutting is always going to be a problem, but I would imagine it would it would ameliorate some of those issues. Mm, yeah. Or like ingrain, turning ingrain corners and stuff. I mean, it's the same thing that like a helical head planer does. You know, it's very, it tames a lot of tear out because of the, you know, the helical nature of it. So you're not getting one big wide blade hitting all at the same time. I'd be willing to bet you that you could get a lot cleaner cut, but also less scary on yeah. some of those like turning corners. And when you do are forced to do a climb cut. I, hmm, I sure. have the white side. One's kind of like that where it's, well, it's not inserts, but it's like the compression style. Mm -hmm. And I have the woodpeckers one now too, where they're, they're both, they're, they're just carbide, but they're on, they're not straight <coughs> knives or whatever, they're spiral bits, spiral, spiral flush yeah. trim things. And to this day, even when I'm going around into end grain, I'm like, nah, cause I'm so yeah. used to the straight knives. I'm like, I can't, little baby bites, little baby bites. They're like, no, yep. it's fine. Cause it's, it's shearing the whole time. It's not actually like yep. scooping yeah. in and scooping. I remember the, I actually just showed this. I think I did. I can't tell what's been released and what's not. I don't remember. But I was I'm right there uh, with you. <laughs> I was doing a flush trim around a leg part, and it was using William Ng's uh, Big Daddy bit, mm -hmm. the one that's like a massive spiral bit. And one of the things when I was there, him showing and demoing this thing was how he would just kind of wrap it around doing a, like, I, I don't remember what leg it was, but it was a, a yeah, table leg right. or something. But like, how does he wrap knock around. that whole thing off? What's that? How does it not just blow that whole thing off because it's like he's coming around a corner into like a short I'm, I'm range watching section. Him, I'm like, as soon as he gets to the end of the, like the foot on the leg, I'm uh -huh. like, ah, no, don't do it. And he's just like, no, 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 no. As long as you don't like come off the bearing and then charge back in, you mm -hmm. just kind of keep rolling it all the way around. You go all the way around that template. I was, so I've gotten used to it, but it is intimidating on bits <laughs> like that. That was the bit that <laughs> launched all the big daddy bits. I feel like, yeah, you know, we started seeing that bit from William and it was suddenly like everybody had a monster bit, like every manufacturer mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then suddenly every woodworker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it true. started it all. That's true. Good job, William. Thank you. Well done. Okay, we're going to take a little break here to hear some messages from some advertisers. Some privileged people won't see or hear anything. Let's go out to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby have ourselves a snack okay so let's get into our questions and we got a few here i'm excited all right so we got one here from fanton and his question or her i don't know uh, i don't know the, are you guys familiar with that name fanton have you ever heard of that you think i know names <laughs> i was i was actually just asking chan and i was being polite <laughs> But I was I really just talking. You. <laughs> Time gone by. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> the question is about shop in an HOA. They say, I am moving houses in the next month or so. And while I'm very excited, I'll be almost tripling the area of my shop from 300 square feet to almost 900 Woo! square feet. Yeah, congrats. Woo! The house is in an HOA. Um, Mark, had his <laughs> shop. <laughs> uh, Mark had his shop and house in Denver in an HOA, so I'm wondering if he has any tips and tricks to minimize problems. I'm especially concerned about noise. Have you had any issues? And if so, how'd you deal with it? For context, the shop is in a separate outbuilding, not too far for, from our neighbors. It's insulated with a mini split, so I don't have to keep the doors open. And I make commissioned furniture pieces and eventually run... Oh, eventual runs of smaller products. All right, so this this is really situation dependent. Uh, every neighborhood is a little bit different. Um, I guess maybe we should also say what a HOA is. Maybe some people live in places that don't have them or countries that don't have them. I don't know. But it's a homeowners association that has a really, really bad reputation uh, because they can <laughs> dictate what you can and cannot do on your own property. So mostly they are hated. The thing that I've found with HOAs, and I probably have just gotten lucky, is that um, they're not that bad. And, huh. and sometimes there are benefits, and but there are always hoops you have to jump through when it comes to an HOA. What's tricky about this situation, and I don't know if you guys have had to deal with HOAs before with the shop, but when it comes to an HOA, if you ask the question, you are alerting them 
to a thing, right? And that has always been my policy. Now, this is not necessarily advice because it's not great advice if it is, but this is what I've done. Sometimes you just don't say anything. You get in there, you make sure that you're as quiet as possible. You're only working when most people are at work during the day. And after hours, when people are at home, you stop anything that's making lots of noise. Also get in there, run the tools, make it as loud as it's ever going to be, and then go outside and listen to what it sounds like. And how much does that dissipate? The more space between you guys, the better off you are because the sound just kind of like spreads out. But you want to go and hear what other people are going to hear. So you know if you have to run out and do something real quick at nine o'clock at night, is that going to disturb anyone? You just want to be under the radar. So I, I, I kind of feel a little apprehensive about giving this advice because it's not the correct thing to do, but it's what a lot of us get away with. And as long as you're not disturbing anybody and then maybe once in a while make something for your neighbors, like a nice there set of cutting go. boards, there uh, you go. That's what make I friends with them so that if they do hear those tools, they're like, oh, it's just Fanton making the, making those cutting boards that he or she is making, you know, <laughs> having a good time in there in the shop. Um, I also, if you are running until they don't insulin, get one. And yeah. then they're like, well, just, there's Fenton making those cutting boards I haven't yeah. gotten yet. Got to do the immediate <laughs> neighbors. <laughs> Definitely the immediate surrounding neighbors. If you have an insulated shop like that and you keep those doors closed, chances are it's going to block a lot of that sound out. It, it should be actually really effective. Even if you're not doing any significant soundproofing techniques in there, it will be fairly effective. I never, even with neighbors pretty darn, like in Denver, our neighbor's house on one side was like right on top of us, but they worked normal hours. I think actually the the wife stayed home. They never mentioned a single thing. They, they and, and I've tested it myself. I would stand in their driveway with my dust collector running. And if I can't hear anything, or maybe it sounds like a distant vacuum cleaner, but distant, distant, they certainly aren't hearing anything in their house. Right. So I think you just kind of do those things. Now, the other answer is to ask to read the rules and find out what you can and cannot do, because there will be things regarding running a business in that space. And if you're going to have any kind of traffic coming to the location, uh, of course, noise and a wood products business running there could be problematic. But what they won't know won't kill them. <laughs> so that's that's my advice on that. Just having experienced it three different neighborhoods three different HOAs, and I never once had a serious problem uh, as a result of doing all the woodworking that I do there. So just me. Uh, okay, Matt, you're up. Okay, this is from Bill in Brainerd, Minnesota. Bill says, I'm currently building some upper cabinet doors for my wife. I'll be doing that soon. They are a plain frame and panel design. Wish she wants. That's good. I'm, I'm glad that some, you're making what she wants. That's You're Could doing you it right so far. You didn't? <laughs> <laughs> uh, everything sounds good so far, Bill. Okay. <laughs> Two and three quarter inch wide uh, maple rails and styles with quarter inch plywood to be painted. I have found, like many other woodworkers, that uh, my dado blade stack does not get narrow enough to make the perfect fit for a quarter inch piece of plywood. So I end up using a method of running it through the table saw and then turning around and setting it through again to make sure that the groove is centered in the styles and rails. I have the forest woodworker two and it does not leave a nice flat bottom in the dado due to the angled teeth. It is a, a good quality table saw blade with square tooth design that is designed to be wide enough to just fit a quarter inch plywood without having to set it through twice. I do own a router, but not a router table. So as much as I like to recommend buying more stuff, <laughs> I don't think you need a flat bottom for this. Yeah. I think you just go with it. Roll with it. I had one Cut of those. I can't remember who told me I needed one and I sold it like a month later. Unless you're going to see the end of that thing and you want that piece of plywood to be like nicely nested in there without a gap. Call it a glue, glue well. A little bit of space for some glue to go when you're gluing that thing up. Send it. It's tiny. It's so small. I say for, send in it. In that context, right? Yeah, I don't think you need to go crazy with this. As long as it fits in there, you're not going to see the bottom of that groove ever. You don't need it touching and bottoming out. Yeah. Save, save your money and buy uh, buy your wife something nice. Buy a router plane. Hey, he's doing enough. Or right? that. He's I making guess. her if the you, cabinets she wants. <laughs> if you want to go ahead and clean it up, router plane will do that too. So there you go. Yeah. Buy your wife something nice that. or buy yourself a router plane. Do what you want. Or buy I a square that tube in hybrid plane. woodworking by Mark Spagnolo. Mm -hmm. Or buy a book. Yep. Ching. Or buy yourself a book. You, Do whatever. You deserve it. You've been working hard. Um, <laughs> how about the like router table? If he's got a router table, he could just get a undersized plywood bit and make these grooves with the router. Is yeah. there something he do said? Do they make them for the quarter inch plywood? They yes, they small? do. Matt, I don't know. I don't use those. How they the make a router bit for everything. You know they do. 
They make they make those little like Shelix head router bits. I heard about that <laughs> yeah, on the show do. one time. I think you can get undersized in quarter, half, and okay, three well, quarter. I don't know if it's like be too frail and break all but the time. You know what the problem is though? The problem with that is it still might be too loose. Um, That's true. Because it's never perfect. Or it's too tight. Yeah. <laughs> or it's too tight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a loose I, I, I personally <laughs> like the turn it around and cut it twice technique rather than yeah. rather than trying to get it centered up. Yep. That's what I would do. And I do, I do, I actually think it's worth it to get a flat bottom bit or not bit, a flat bottom <laughs> uh, blade. I do have one and I like it for things like this because I do get a little like, because I have it, why not use it? But yeah. I do not think it's necessary. It's just fun to, yeah. to have a nice Mark flat spent bottom. far too much time working with Daryl Peart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get my calipers out. It's just an itch. There's, it's not a flat bottom. <laughs> I throw the part away. That is 0. 0.251. Well, you, you need a little room in there for your hot glue, right? Is that, That's was, right. Yep. <laughs> That's how you stop that. He, he did that. And I was like, that's genius. Yeah. And the fact that you think it's okay to do that makes me feel like it's okay to do that. <laughs> it makes me warm and squishy. Now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Squishy like a Dougie butt. Mm, yep. <laughs> oh, boy. Another reason to watch the video version of, of what talk is Dougie He always butt lays like that. He always throws one leg out the back. Yep. Always, his, just, always the left hind leg just goes always winking at me you. with that one eye back there yep always uh, with the butt to me let's see oh this is from jonathan he says i got one of those acuber thingies and i love it if you don't know those are the the sh scraper sharpening dealy whackers that are sweeping the nation um do you guys know what that is <laughs> yeah the little I brass one. one yes yeah okay um, um they're great. So he says it, it's really helped um, use my card scrapers more effectively. Is it necessary to flatten and square the edge every time I use it, or can you get away with pulling the berg in multiple times between flattening and squaring the edge? I've tried repulling the edge with mixed success. I'm not sure if it's me or the process that's failing. Probably me. Oh, fuck oh, up, Jonathan. You know so that. sad. That's so sad. In in my experience, you know, the answer is always a maddening. It depends because one scraper to the other is going to have different steel, different hardness of steel. Basically, my my tried and true method here is I keep using the little burnisher dealy whacker until it doesn't work anymore. And then I go back and I hone the edge, you know, grind the edge and then pull the burr again. I've, I've been able to do it three times, six times sometimes. You know, it also depends on the species of wood you're using. You know, the yeah. squirrelier woods are going to deform that burr a lot faster. The more, and, and really what's happening is the, the burr is bent in an angle and you're essentially flattening back out. And then every time you bend it over, you're kind of, I'm going to call it work hardening and there's going to be a metallurgist who says, that's not work hardening, it's something else. It's <laughs> it's weakening it, something. Um, so every time you bend it back, eventually it's just going to just snap off. You, that leaves kind of a frayed edge, which is why you then go back and re-hone the edge. You grind the edge 90 degrees. I like to hone it. I take it up to 8,000 grit on my stones, just like you would a, you know, a chisel or a plane blade. So the other aspect, if you're finding that you're not able to pull that burr, you know, a couple of times, every time you have it and go back to it, mm -hmm. I would actually spend more time on the honing side and you'll find that it will last a lot longer. Not only will the burr last longer, but you'll be able to, to recurve or reshape that burr multiple times without having to to regrind and rehone. You maybe just aren't honing well enough. It'd be the same thing with a chisel or a plain blade. If you don't hone it well enough, it's just a weaker blade because yeah. it's more of a frayed than unified edge. There you go. All right, so we got one more. It's a group question, and this is from uh, Les. He says, this "I'm actually we all answer it once. Ready? Go." Yeah. Well, let's all read it at the same time, too. Um, okay, he said he already asked me this question on the Wood Whisper Patreon, but would be interested to hear Matt and Shannon's options as well, particularly Shannon. Again, it's always great uh -oh. when you say who can and can't answer your question. <laughs> we like we that. We go like the that. opposite direction every time. <laughs> yeah, we enjoy that. Uh, so Dougie's going to grab this one. I recently discovered the Raleigh, I guess that's how you pronounce that, hand planes that use disposable blades and seem very simple to set up, adjust, and use. I'm curious to see if any of you have an opinion on these planes or just the general concept. I have often found myself wishing I had a hand plane for specific tasks, but I'm mainly, mainly a power tool woodworker. These seem, in theory, to be a good way for a power tool guy 
to get the function and benefit of hand planes when one is called for without the steep learning curve or all the sharpening equipment. The only thing I really sharpen currently is my chisels, which I do by hand on a cheap diamond stone, and I'm uh, just adequate at it. My turning tools are all carbide insert type tools. Thanks for any input, opinions that you guys are willing to offer. So these are like literally disposable blades that once they're spent, you throw a new one in there. Have you seen these, Shannon? What are your thoughts? I've seen a couple of these. I don't know if it's the exact brand that I'm looking at, but like the blade almost looks like a, like a razor blade, like those disposable yeah. razor blades. Like a straight razor. Um, at least the one that I saw. I've also seen a couple where there's much more modular components to it. So mm -hmm. essentially what he's looking for is he wants a hand plane, but he doesn't want to learn to sharpen or doesn't want to like, you know, any more than what he's already doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess I don't really have a problem with that. Whatever gets you into, you know, if you find that the hand planes are going to be <laughs> useful to your work and it's going to get you into it, then yeah. why not? The teacher in me is kind of like, ah, you're doing yourself a disservice by not learning how to sharpen the blade. But like, who am I to say? If it gets you using a hand plane, I'm excited, frankly. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> more than likely you'll find that, again, I should probably look at the exact thing. I would just worry about like the quality of the blade. Like if it's disposable, it must be thinner. It must be like, is it going to vibrate more? Like how does the plane actually function as compared to, you know, a decent plane? And then of course, what is really the cost savings overall? I mean, I, I know a lot of casual hand plane users who will go and spend the money on a Veritas or something like that and not sharpen it out of the box like you say you're supposed to. Go with the factory sharpened edge and go years on the factory sharpened edge because they don't use it that much. You know, I, I'm not recommending that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know that I really have an opinion other than, you know, if it works for you, do it. Well, give them the uh, educator opinion, like your real honest opinion <laughs> in terms of <laughs> your yeah. judgmental opinion. <laughs> <laughs> the opinion I know you want to give, but you're, you're trying to be nice. <laughs> Like, I mean, I, I think it, that let's say this is someone he really wants to like get deeper into woodworking because I my advice, nurse. like when I gave him advice, mine was like, <laughs> I think that. sharpening is an integral part of woodworking. Right. And it's, it yeah. sucks sometimes, but I think it's part of it. And I, I think there's value in learning that skill beyond this hand plane situation. And I, I love yeah. the fact that my hand planes and chisels are like the one thing that will likely outlast me. And I don't have to replace anytime soon. You know, like that's, there's comfort in that. Um, I think that and, and the again, one thing that resonates me with, with less is when he brings up the fact that he has carbide insert turning tools, like you're speaking my language, man, like <laughs> turning tools suck to sharpen. Yeah. Like, that's a different they're story. <laughs> awful. And yeah. that's like the whole reason that I have like easy wood tool turning tools because I don't have to deal with that. Yeah. Um, so like, I, I get it. I totally get it, but it's, a, it's a gateway skill learning to sharpen. And honestly, I think we make, well, like in most things in woodworking, we make such a big deal about it. It's not that hard. It really isn't. It sucks that, yeah, you may have to go buy some more stones. Maybe you need to buy a honing guide and then you're like, oh, I got to buy a Tormek now. No, you, you don't have to do a lot of that, but ultimately you're going to want to be able to maintain your tools and a hand plane is another tool. You know, you're going to mm -hmm. want to clean your table saw blades and yes, you can send those off to be sharpened, but there's other maintenance that, you know, you're not sending things off to, 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 to fix what the table saw or the band saw, or, you know, change the sandpaper. Sandpaper is maybe a bad example. That's disposable, but yeah. you know, it's part of, of part of woodworking. And I also think that, Chances are, if you start using a hand plane, I don't care how much of a power tool, you know, wonk you are, you're going to appreciate what the hand plane will do for you. And eventually you're going to say, you know, oh, well, now I want to get a Lee Nielsen or a Veritas and you're going to have to learn to sharpen eventually. So I think your evolutionary track, you can't avoid it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to learn to sharpen at some point. So it's the buy your last tool first thing. How much money do you want to sink into Band-Aid solutions before you finally say, all right, I'm going to learn to sharpen? Yeah. Um, only you can answer that based on your disposable income. But yeah, I, I just think that these planes or I'll call it what it is, the gimmicky type tools that try to find workarounds for basic skills just end up doing you a disservice, your skill set a disservice later on. Mm-hmm. There. Interesting too. <laughs> yeah, that's better. Um, <laughs> they also have replaceable tip chisels, which is interesting. They, that's well, I was looking weird. at the blades. They got the steel and they got carbide ones as well. Mm -hmm. But as I'm looking at hmm. this, it's like it brings me. The only thing I can think of is like, is though? the plane itself any good? 
Because yeah, like, that's what I worry about. If like, the blade is like replaceable or whatever, but is the sole flat? Does, like, does the adjustment mechanism work? Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, is this even a good product, regardless of the fact that it's got an interchangeable blade? Yeah, I have to look at the um, uh, to look at the videos to get a little bit better idea of what what the like underside looks like. Because like when you think about like the regardless of the blade, you look at like cheap planes versus like expensive planes. Like if you go like a Lee Nielsen versus like a Stanley you buy now, where like you could spend like a week and a half tuning up the Stanley, and it may or may not cut as good as the Lee Nielsen out of the box because yeah. the machining is so much better out of the box. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't. I don't know. Yeah, have you I, seen I them, just, Matt? Did you look at these? Just now. Okay. Yeah. While Shannon so, like, was talking, planes, I was looking through them. The planes are really interesting looking too. Um, they look like an Erector set. Like yeah. going back yeah. going back to my childhood here. They ship um, flat packed. <laughs> you gotta, gotta yeah. screw them together when you get it. Like, well, they got I a mean, little bit of that. Um, there's a Bridge City vibe mm -hmm. to them. And, mm -hmm. and not yeah. like, uh, like a low rent Bridge City in a way in that design. So it's not, it's not entirely bad. It's just very I mean, non-traditional. This is um, something like I, I would see this. I'm like, I would never buy this because I'm like, this looks like some kind of gimmicky cheap thing to me. Just looking at it. Like if I just, if I just stumbled across this or just like came up with like an ad on Facebook, I'd be like, this is some crap thing that someone's trying to sell <laughs> as drop yeah. shipping it or whatever. But well, they sell them in sustainers. They sell <laughs> everything. They gotta be good. That's, that's, that's how you know, like, it's the market quality marketing. It it does have like a somewhat German toolmaker vibe feel like the site itself. I feel like they're, I don't know where they're from, but uh, yeah, I don't know. There's something that looks very, almost like a child's toy when I look at the plane. Yeah. At least there's a, there's an interesting practicality to it though. I yeah. Mean, and oh, like no in, the, in, in a good way, you know, that's, I don't know. It's uh, it's something I would have to have in hand. I mean, that's the other thing is how does it cut? What's it? That's, you know, how does it behave on different woods? Like this is not something like, like oh yeah, that's great. I don't know. Yeah. I, mean, I would have to actually have this in my hand and try it and compare it to what I'm used to. Again, yep. regardless of the fact that the blade is replaceable, I think that's like a whole another separate thing. Mm -hmm. It's like how yeah, functional no, is this thing to sorry. begin with? It's only sixty dollars cheaper than a than a Wood River Jack. Pay the sixty bucks. Like, I mean, that that's Wood River. Wood River, uh, I haven't looked at uh, Lee Nielsen. I mean, Lee Nielsen, love them, but, you know, they're still long waiting lists. Um, mm -hmm. what's, a, what's a Veritas Jack running for these days? Because they have so many different Jack planes. I don't know. Well, but, you also got that um, uh, Melbourne Tools. Um, yeah. Like, I, I look at company. Wood River as a good kind of middle of the road premium plane. That, sound, mm -hmm. that sounded like a contradiction. But... Um, they're great planes. I've been using two Wood River planes for more than 10 years. So I have like the first generation, the mm -hmm. one that they've improved on like four times now. Fantastic planes. Never had a problem with them. It's $60 more than this thing. And like Mark said, it will outlive you. Right? It'll still mm -hmm. be just effective. Um, and, you know, maybe we're selling Raleigh short just because they're new and different and we fear change according, you know. <laughs> we fear change. Garth Algar there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. Well, I see one of the uh, banner ads says because um, I'd be curious about longevity. Uh, one blade equals one mile of chips. Uh, small print factory test with soft wood. Yeah, there you go. Wah, wow. wah, wah. We, you know, so it's like okay, well, that doesn't mean anything to to folks like us. Um, all right, well, that's interesting. Um, it's hard to hard to review something if we don't have it in hand. But I, I think uh, this certainly is, this compelling. Is interesting, but. You, I think you need to have like, you gotta spend some money and buy some stuff and see if it's any good. Mm -hmm. Someone's got, someone's got to do it. Yeah. Well, let us know less, <laughs> <laughs> especially if you do try it. Uh, let us know what you think. All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us. I want you to remember that this show is made possible by the generous contributions of our patrons. And if you'd like to help out and get your name right on the show and also get an ad free version of the show, head over to patreon.com slash wood talk. I'm going to, I'm going to go back to the beginning of the show and say, now is the time we want to hear who you would cast in woodworking versus the HOA. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> And Jack and Black, most likely. You can't just take the cast of the Burbs and repurpose it because that's what's in my head. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm going first. We're back. We're going to ask you some stupid, silly questions that have very little to do with woodworking. Like, who would you cast in woodworking versus the HOA? Mm -hmm. Perfect. That's it. And you can send those in to woodtalk at gmail.com, woodtalkshow at gmail.com. 
One of these Good days I'll get the email right. You will. You'll get there one yeah. day. All right. Well, Dougie, shush. I'll let you out in a second. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will catch you next time. Goodbye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Goodbye.